Now that we've seen that it is spontaneous for gases to mix, let's now look at solutions. Ideal solutions follow Raoult's law, being the partial vapor pressure of a substance in its liquid mixture is proportional to its mole fraction in the mixture and its vapor pressure when pure. In other words, P sub J is equal to the mole fraction of the jth component times P star J. Let's look at an illustration of Raoult's law. Consider a two-component mixture. These liquid mixtures are going to be in equilibrium with their vapor phase. This means that there is a partial pressure associated with each component. Here are three images that show pure components A and B on the left and right, and a 50-50 mixture by moles in the center. P star is the partial pressure of the gas when it is pure, so on the left the partial pressure of the vapor is P star A, and on the right it is P star B. In the middle, since there is half as much of A and B in the mixture, assuming that the solution is ideal, the partial pressure of both components is one half P star A and one half P star B. Returning to the slide, the plot on the right also illustrates Raoult's law. When each component is pure, meaning that the other is not present, the mole fraction of that component is equal to 1. As the two components are mixed, the mole fraction changes and the partial pressure varies proportionally. For example, if a two-component mixture is mixed 50-50, meaning they both have a mole fraction of 0.5, then the partial pressure of the vapor phase is going to be half what it would have been if that component were pure. Raoult's law also allows us to quantify the chemical potential, mu sub j, of each component of a solution based on their vapor pressure. Starting from pure components denoted by the asterisk, and assuming that the vapor and liquid phases are at equilibrium, we can say the chemical potential of the pure liquid substance is equal to the chemical potential of the pure gas. This is also equal to the standard chemical potential of the gas times RT times the natural logarithm of the partial pressure of the pure component divided by the standard pressure. Rearranging this to solve for the standard chemical potential for component J gives the standard chemical potential is equal to the chemical potential of the pure liquid minus RT times the natural logarithm of the partial pressure of the pure component divided by the standard pressure. For each component in a binary mixture, as we vary the mole fraction, we get the chemical potential of the pure liquid substance at some defined point in the mixture is equal to the chemical potential of the pure gas. This is also equal to the standard chemical potential of the gas times RT times the natural logarithm of the partial pressure of the pure component divided by the standard pressure. Since the standard chemical potential is the same in both cases, pure and mixed, then we can put them together to get the chemical potential of the jth component in the liquid phase is equal to the chemical potential of the pure liquid of the jth component minus RT times the natural logarithm of the partial pressure of the pure component divided by the standard pressure, plus RT times the natural logarithm of the actual partial pressure of the component divided by the standard pressure. Using logarithm rules to combine the two natural logarithm terms, we can cancel our standard pressures to get the chemical potential of the pure jth component plus RT times the natural logarithm of the actual partial pressure of component J in the mixture divided by the partial pressure of the pure jth component. And so according to Raoult's law, we can also write that the mole fraction of the jth component is equal to the actual partial pressure of component J in the mixture divided by the partial pressure of the jth component when pure. So doing so, we get the chemical potential of the jth component is equal to the chemical potential of the pure jth component plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of component J. Let's now see how this works in practice for solutions. So here we have a simple example where we're trying to find the change in chemical potential, in this case it's just a benzene, at 25 degrees Celsius, where what we've done is we've mixed it with a solute where that solute is at a mole fraction of 0.1. So what we're assuming here is a binary mixture where we have benzene as our solvent and it has a mole fraction of 0.9 and then we have some solute where its mole fraction is equal to 0.1. And the question that it's asking is, what is the change in the chemical potential of benzene due to the fact that I've added this solute to my solution? As always, a change in chemical potential or a change in anything is just the final minus the initial. And so let's write that out. I know that in my initial case for the benzene, well, what we had was we had the chemical potential of the pure benzene 
plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction. And in this case, in the initial case, the mole fraction is equal to 1. And so if x is equal to 1, then the natural logarithm of 1, that is 0. That just means that in the initial case, I had a pure component, or I had a pure benzene solution. And so it's not really a surprise then that the initial chemical potential in this case is equal to the chemical potential of the pure solution, or the pure substance, which in this case is just benzene. In the final case, this is now where we've added in this solute. And so if I write out again just the standard um, equation, or the full equation for this, well that's just the chemical potential of the pure um, component, in this case this is of the pure benzene, and now I've got RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of benzene. Well in this case, the mole fraction of benzene has now been dropped to 0 0.9. But that now is the final chemical potential of my benzene. And so if I put these two things together in my change in chemical potential of benzene, well I have my final, which is the standard chemical potential of the pure benzene, plus RT times the natural logarithm of 0 0.9. And to that I'm going to subtract off the chemical potential of pure benzene. So now I can cancel out the chemical potential of pure benzene terms, and I will now substitute in for R, 8.3145 times the temperature, 25 plus 273.15 times the natural logarithm of 0 0.9. And so in the end what I get is minus 261 joules per mole. So of course, this number that we just calculated, this minus 261 joules per mole, this is just the chemical potential of one of two components in this mixture. And so if we wanted to then determine if it's spontaneous for these two things to actually mix together once we combine them, then we're going to have to solve for that explicitly, which is what we're going to do in this second problem, being that we're going to show that the mixing of an ideal solution is in fact spontaneous. And again, what that means is that the change in Gibbs free energy that occurs through the process of actually mixing these two things is going to be less than zero. And so let's just draw our initial and final picture again. So the initial picture is that we have essentially two beakers. One of them has one thing in it and another thing has a second thing in it. And we'll just call this A and B. And then we have a final case where we've mixed these two things together and that this is just going to be A plus B. And we have all the same rules that we had before, where in this case we have Na plus Nb gives me the total number of moles. And so what we're going to do then is we're going to calculate the initial and the final Gibbs free energy. So here we'll find the initial Gibbs free energy. From this we'll find the final. And then we'll just subtract the two and we'll find out if, if it's less than the, the zero, then we know that the process of mixing these two things together is spontaneous. So starting with the initial Gibbs free energy, we know that that's just going to be equal to the total number of moles of A times the chemical potential of A plus the number of moles of B plus times the chemical potential of B. So number of moles of A, the chemical potential of A is the chemical potential of the pure substance plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A. To that I'm going to add the, uh, the number of moles of B times the chemical potential of the pure B component plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B. And in both these cases, since I've got mixtures that are separated from each other, the mole fraction of B in this case is equal to 1, and the mole fraction of A is equal to 1. And we know then that the natural logarithm of 1, well, that goes to 0. And so all we're left with then is number of moles of A times the chemical potential of the pure plus number of moles of B times the chemical potential of the pure B, which isn't a necessarily a surprising result since I do have pure separated components all on their own. For the Gibbs free energy of the final case, we start from the same spot, number of moles of A times the chemical potential of A plus the number of moles of B times the chemical potential of B, and in here I'm just going to substitute in for the chemical potential, so number of moles of A times the chemical potential of the pure A component plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A. And to that I'm going to add the number of moles of B times the chemical potential of B of the pure component 
plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B. Finally, if I distribute in my number of moles of A and my number of moles of B, I get Na times mu star A plus Na RT natural logarithm of XA plus NB times mu star B plus NB times RT natural logarithm of XB. And so now I have my initial Gibbs free energy, I have my final Gibbs free energy, and so then just to calculate the change in Gibbs free energy, I'm just going to say the final minus the initial. So my final in this case is number of moles of A, chemical potential of the pure component of A, plus Na, the number of moles of A, times RT, natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A, plus number of moles of B, times the chemical potential of the pure B -th component, plus number of moles of B, times RT, times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B. From that, I'm going to subtract off number of moles of A times the chemical potential of the A component, the pure A component, plus the number of moles of B times the chemical potential of the pure B -th component. I'm going to start canceling out like terms. I have number of moles times the standard, or the pure component chemical potential of A minus number of moles times the chemical potential of the pure component A. Here I have the number of moles of B times the chemical potential of the pure component B minus number of moles of B times the chemical potential of the pure component B. And so what that leaves me with is just these two terms that I'm outlining here, which are number of moles of A times RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A, plus the number of moles of B times RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B. And so just like before, we can express the mole fraction of some component J as being the number of moles of J divided by the total number of moles. And if I rearrange, then we can say number of moles of the jth component is equal to the mole fraction of that component times the total number of moles. Using this substitution here, what I'm going to get is the mole fraction of A times the total number of moles times RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A plus the mole fraction of B times the total number of moles times RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B. And if I distribute out total number of moles R and T, then I get NRT times the mole fraction of A times the natural logarithm of A plus the mole fraction of B times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B. And so in this case, again, we can see that the mole fractions are going to be numbers between 0 and 1, which means that these natural logarithm terms here are going to be negative numbers, which means that this whole expression is going to be a bunch of positive numbers multiplied by a negative number, which means that this is going to be negative. And so the upshot is, is that the change in Gibbs free energy, which we were calculating here, is going to be less than zero, which means that when we mix these two things together, they will mix together.